Yes, this is the last class of this course. And uh, today's topics are just to wrap up this section of process monitoring and then just talk about our final exam at the end. Uh, before we get started, though, there's some old assignment, three, four, five, at the front here. Um, if you've got your current assignment to your main format over there on the spot side, and I have not yet picked up your written forms that I have with you today. So let's uh, just quickly recap where we were in the last class um, last week. We were looking at process monitoring, and process monitoring is the actions we take when we try to construct one of these monitoring charts. So here, for example, there's an EWA chart to look at. Key characteristics are the upper controller, the lower controller, and the target. And we were talking at the end of last class just how we might go about doing that. Monitoring chart for a process where you don't get a single number, but rather you get a whole vector of numbers. So here, just a recap this case, we're getting a spectrum of values, and what that spectrum is, many of you will be familiar with it in chemistry courses, is that we acquire at certain wavelengths lambda a spectrum of information, and that spectrum will have very peaks and values. And I said at the last class, we could go take those the, the spectral data, which comes to us in the form of a vector. In this instance, the data set is publicly available. The vector is 650 points. So there will be 650 points along that vector from beginning to end, which forms that shape for us. What we can do is we can use any number of methods to compress those 650 values down to one interesting value, and then build a monitoring chart for that compressed information. Now clearly that compressed information will not be the full set of information. By its nature, we have to choose some features that we really find importance on this graph and compress that down to my single number. Okay? So we won't spend too much detail on that, but the key thing is that this the sort of over here, which we won't go into discussion, how you take this 650 data points and come out here with one number, or maybe two numbers, or three numbers on the other side, is a topic for an entirely different course that can be as long as this one. So we won't go into that detail, but the key thing is that, that you monitor that single number now. So here I get one spectrum, and this will form my first point on that plot. And then I'll apply another spectrum, this time in green perhaps, and when I compress that 650 values in the green curve down, I'll acquire my second point in time. And then I might acquire a third one, so on, in red, and that point to be that point. So we're simply taking these data and finding the interesting parts Pressing it down to a single number and monitoring on that single variable. We can step it up, as I said last time as well, by looking at not only vectors of information, but look at matrices. Here, in fact, we have a three dimensional matrix. We have x, y, and lambda, my wavelengths. And this sort of data, you will certainly see this in your career. This was only starting to become prevalent in chemical engineering about 10 years ago. We had a graduate student purchase one of these. to import the instrument into Canada even for research purposes. They were severely scrutinized in order to do that. Nowadays, though, this is an almost off-the-shelf type of device. You still pay a lot of money for it, but you will start to see it being used more and more. Where it's particularly useful is when you're dealing with plastics and solids and other sorts of nature of well, materials that you can't easily measure for information. So, for example, the student here back Used it, uh, two different students in fact used it, one was called polymer imaging. So what you're essentially acquiring is a chemical image of the polymer. You're looking right at the chemical composition of that polymer, and not just at the surface, but the spectral information actually goes below the surface. So you're able to acquire an inside view of what the polymer chemistry is doing, and that's a measurement of the quality of the product. The other students, uh, she used it to image seeds, so grains, Soil beans and uh, corn, particularly, and was able and oatmeal, and was able to then predict properties of that grain, and then use that to make decisions on how that grain was processed. So uh, you will certainly see this in your career, especially for those of you that work particularly in the solid processing industry. Uh, if you work in medical imaging, um, you will acquire this sort of data. An MRI is nothing more than a three-dimensional scan on the body. Next one. So again, you're 
here's another example of image data being used. Not the solids or liquids, but, uh, uh, sorry, not the solids, but this time actually on the liquid. But on the group, who was a student here, with John McGregor, uh, worked on this problem where they put a camera right inside a boiler. And the interesting issue was that that flame on the boiler was burning material that had variable energy content. So it was burning waste, essentially, so biomass. Many of you have worked in biomass projects. We know that biomass comes from all sorts of sources, so you get a variation in that material. And as you burn it, you might have some biomass release more energy, and a couple of minutes later, the biomass being burnt has less energy. So what these boilers, biomass boilers will do is they will top up that with the natural gas input as well. So natural gas will be burnt, and then the liquid waste of variable intensity is also burnt. The idea is that you're using this boiler to create steam, drive a turbine, and make electricity, or reduce that energy in some way. The problem, however, comes from that variability in the waste, liquid stream, in that you can't anticipate for it. Right? So any of you that remember your control course, we'd like to produce a constant output of a constant flow of steam or a constant amount of energy. And ideally, we would be able to predict and use the feed-forward mode what that liquid waste fuel is, and then ratio that to the natural gas so we always get a constant steam flow rate. So what we moved did was she used this image data from the boiler at DuPont in Kingston and was able to predict the energy content and build a monitoring chart for that. So she was able to show the trends just from the flame itself, the, the pixel intensity, the number of white pixels versus dark pixels, the color image information, and they were able to use to predict the energy content. So there's another image case study. Here's another, another one that's intuitive. Um, is the free old age project that uh, some of you may see the day before. Um, these sand foods are from zero seasoning up to some higher level of seasoning. Uh, they don't come up to 30 of the images that people work out. But the image, the, sorry, the seasoning intensity is increasing from that to higher The whole comes here, again, remember from process control, the key issue that can mess the surrounding process control system is the time delay in acquiring the data. So if you're measuring the temperature of the distillation volume, you can get that temperature really quickly, take manipulated variable action, and you keep the temperature on target. Free delay doesn't have that luxury. They take a sample once every eight hours, take it to the lab, measure the amount of salt, and that takes a while to, to get that process done. And then they may realize that for the past two hours, <coughs> product that's got the wrong level of seasoning and all that material is wasted. So the ideal case is being able to measure information really quickly and what we did was over two years design a process to measure that image, to measure that seasoning information from the image data. What she did was essentially the same idea where you take that image which is about one megabyte of information and she did and I'll show you next the two-step approach here. So she went from about 10 to the 6 pieces of information, 10 to the 6 pixels, and she compressed it down the information into directions <coughs> that correlate with the seasoning. So the math behind it is, is, is very interesting. It's in these journal publications things over there. But essentially what she did was she found 32 bins which to project all those 10 to the 6 pixels. Every pixel is mapped into one of those bins according to a fairly sophisticated algorithm. So now you've got 32 numbers. And then the final step is to go to one number. And the way she did that last step was to take those 32 bin, count the number of pixels in each bin, so there's bin 1 and n is bin 32, and uncoated images and that sort of representation on Instagram, where it has high seasoning and that representation. Okay. So from that, you use those 32 values in a linear regression model, kind of. It wasn't a true linear regression model. It was called a PLS model, a pre 
projections to these structures, so partial least squares model. And the PLS model there is the step that goes from 32 to 1. So PLS was that step, and actually this step over here is PCA. So both of those, PCA and PLS, uh, are two multivariate measurements that uh, we don't get to study in this course. But there are interesting multivariate methods that do this compression for us, retaining all the information. That's really all that multivariate methods do. It's a compression from a higher dimension to a lower dimension, keeping all the essential information. Okay, so then what Holmberg did was say, now you've got this, this one number, this one number is the seasoning prediction, and the company can build a monitoring chart of seasoning prediction with lower control limits and upper control limits. In fact, Frito Lay took that even a step further, and this has now been implemented across all their production sites as far as I know. It's been, uh, the patent is held by McMaster University. Frito Lay is licensed as a worldwide use, and what they do essentially is they use that for feedback control. So instead of stopping there with a one number and just monitoring it, they now have it in feedback control so that the seasoning is adjusted in real time. So here's, here's the Hong Lu's uh, regression model showing you the accuracy of the lab values versus the model predictions. And that would be what we do in phase one. So we call phase one is where we build our monitoring charts. Let's take a look at phase two. Phase two is you get to use your monitoring chart. Now, not only were we able to predict the seasoning level, but if you go take that image, break it up into small blocks. Each one of those blocks is itself an image. So what you could go do is predict the seasoning in that block, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and so forth. And essentially build the seasoning map for the operators. So if you go to small, smaller blocks, you can get smaller and smaller detail. And here you can see there's a Dorito chip that's unseasoned, there's a Dorito chip that have been unseasoned, there's a few Dorito chips that are overseasoned. And in fact, this was where all loop was taking unseasonable the chips and throwing them onto the conveyor. So that, that, that matched exactly <coughs> what she expected. And what you realize from this is the moment you have this sort of image, you not only have a prediction of seasoning, you have a prediction of seasoning variance, which is also important. Because you don't want a bag of Doritos with average good seasoning, but some of your chips have no seasoning and some of them have too much. That's not desirable either. What you want as a customer is all your chips to be evenly seasoned at the right season. So prediction here of the average seasoning and of the seasoning variance then, in fact what Frito-Lay does now is they have these pictures on display in real time above the variances for the operators to monitor the Okay, so the basic idea of monitoring charts that we looked at can really be escalated up into very, very interesting numbers. Let's take a look at another one that's a little closer to home. I'll jump over these slides in the back in a minute. Um, you may not be aware of this, but the FASCO, Marshall will be tell us they're not called, is one of the most sophisticated uses of control systems and monitoring systems in the world. To the point that uh, some people in the industry recognize them as the world leaders in this area in terms of applications. That was certainly the case a few years ago. Let's take a look at this one example that we will later on. The task has allowed us to take a look at these slides. So here's a ladle of molten steel being um, melted over there. There's some scale there to, to operate this perspective. And that um, molten steel then is, so there's that container that I just showed you in the photograph. That molten steel is poured into, um, into the area and extruded into slabs. So the speed with which they extrude that slab of material is going to be the critical variable in this operation because if you extrude too, too fast, you don't give enough time for this material to cool, you can see what's coming out there is still a molten shell in some way. The edges have crystallized and solidified, but the interior is very much liquid metal. Now, 
Well, that's, that's extruding. If you go too fast, you don't give enough time for that material to cool. Cooling is just simply made up by natural conduction into the atmosphere, and the speed with which you extrude that has to be just right. If you extrude too fast, and the problem occurs, you get what's called a breakout, where this edge is broken open, and molten metal then has now spewed all over your plant floor and potentially operates. So you jam that bullet machinery. So that's to be avoided. If you extrude too slowly, you limit your production. Great. So you want to extrude just fast enough to be safe, but not so slowly that you can't keep up the production shape. Here's a perfect example I mentioned to you earlier that most engineering systems operate just on that edge of the cliff. Our design experiments and getting up the mountain and not falling over the edge of the cliff. This is exactly that. You want to speed up, speed up, speed up, and operate just at the point where you're operating and producing at the best production. If you go any faster, you drop off the edge of the cliff. You catastrophically fail and you cause the same conditions in the process. So, what they've done though here is to monitor this process, they've done a very sophisticated now this screen is out of date. Uh, they, there, there are several iterations and evidence. But the, the essentials here are the same. They have all these variables being wanted. These would be temperatures and all sorts of indicators of the process. All those numbers coming at them at very high sampling speeds. And what they do is they combine those numbers. Now I don't know how many numbers there are, but I judge from the screen that there's at least 30 to 40 variables. And those 30 to 40 variables are being compressed down to two numbers. The first one is stability index one, and the second variable that's being compressed down to is stability index two. <coughs> In latent variable terms, that's your metallic T squared, and that's your square prediction error SP. So we don't cover that again. That's a PCA, stability index one, stability index two. They don't want to tell the operators what that is. So they've just given these new names. And the operators know that as long as stability index 1 and 2 are below 0.8, they're quite happy. This is a one-sided monitoring chart. It's not with the lower control limits. In this case, it's a one-sided monitoring chart because this number has a lower bound than 0. So you can't go smaller than 0. So the one-sided monitoring chart, your water limit is at 0.8, your alarm limit is at 0.8. So the operators will keep moving and adjusting their process as long as they're behaving. As long as they're below the limits, they can keep going at the speed that they're going. Now, if a problem occurs, one of those alarms might show up. In this case, stability index 1 has gone above its value, and the problem is now on the process. So we've got an alarm here. Now, the first thing the operators might consider is that this is also. So what they can do immediately is simply reduce the speed of their extruder. That's going to bring that below the limit again. So simply slow down the process. Now it could still be a false alarm. We haven't determined that yet, but it's a false alarm or a national alarm. So what do they use to figure that out? Well, stability index one is a composite of about 30, 40 pieces of information. That's my guess. That's what they told us was how many go into there. But I can judge from this that most of those variables are involved in the monitoring chart. What the operators also get, not only do they get an alarm of the stability of one, they also get an indication which of the variables most are associated with pushing that value of monitoring. So here's the audit variables, and the operators can go investigate those one at a time. There's your four and troubleshooting. Done in an auto, almost automated way. The operators will go investigate that and verify whether there's a cause, a true cause, for that effect. 
So there's, a, there's quite a bit more behind this monitoring system to, to look at. But the interesting thing is looking at what's happened before and after they built the system. Ninety seven was when they implemented that system. That was the number of great that they had per year, and they've been on the deep flight system. So if a break line costs you about a billion dollars, that reduction from about 10 break a year to 0, 1, 2 break a year is a substantial savings. And so we, we, when we're implementing monitoring charts, not only are we looking at the implementation of it, but then you have to justify to your manager why you're doing this work. The only way you can talk to your manager is in dollar figures. So the manager is not concerned about upper and lower control limits. The manager is only concerned about savings. And there's an easy way to prove it to them. So I give some guidance for you over here on how to implement monitoring charts. This is based on a lot of experience with my work with other companies and developing monitoring charts. Everything covered in these 30 of these 14 points we looked at pretty much in this class in the last week. But here's the key thing all of that. So no one wants to hear about type 1 errors, type 2 errors, no one wants to hear about money, and we can easily convert our savings into money. Let's talk about another final aspect here, and that is process capability. This is another way that we can justify uh, changes in the process, because what process capability does is it's a great way and an established way to compare any change you've made to a process. So I, last, I started this section last week by asking how many of you have heard of Six Sigma, and many of you had. So this is where Six Sigma comes from, which is going to hear the denominator. Six Sigma is a way to also benchmark the process, to tell where the process is operating, and so that you can compare between changes to your own process, and so you can compare changes between Sorry, and your process to your competitor's process. So it's not uncommon for a company to go to their suppliers and get their capability. So when, you're, when one of your customers comes to you and asks you for your process capability, what are they asking you for? Well, they're asking you to calculate this number, PCR, process capability ratio. Let's take a look at that. It says, take a look at your process. And you should be operating at some sort of target. So here's your, here's your quality variable. And it should be at some target. We'll call it X double one. Now, you're producing product on that process. And when you're producing product, it's not at the target. Sometimes it's above and below and around the target. <coughs> but what we do have is we have a very clear limits, which are called specification limits. Upper specification limits and a lower specification. These are not your control limits. We derived the shoe on control limits earlier. These are not the same thing. Specification limits are stated to you. You're told the company's policy is produce this product so that the quality of that variable is between those bounds. So that you don't get to change these ever. These are fixed. This is not like a control chart where you can move your limits up and down. The specification limits are exactly that. They're specified to you. Your customers dictate it or your company's policy dictates it. If you produce a product within those bounds, that's it. It's not negotiable if they stay there. So you can never change those. So if you come to judge your capability, well, one way to judge your capability is simply to count how many times you're within the limit versus how many times you're outside the limit. Is to calculate how well you stay within the limit. If you can produce 100% of your product within the limit, You've got a great process capability, but you won't have that. In practice, you won't have some of your product outside those needs. So how do we judge that? 
will take the limit's range and divide it by six sigma. Six sigma is a number that's the sigma there refers to the spread of your data. So how constant can you produce your product? You've got a very, very high standard deviation. You're producing product that's all over the map. So sigma is large, you're producing product all over the map. You've got a very low PCR. If you've got very good control of your process, you've got a very low standard deviation, so a small denominator here, your PCR is high. You want your PCR to be as high as you possibly can. So again, let's take a look at this. Here's a very bad process. Here's a process with a low specification limit, a uh, specification limit, and if you superimpose the histogram of the product from that process, a lot of it is below the lower spec limit and one of it is above the upper spec limit. And if you put, let's put some concrete values onto this, your average, the target is 80, the lower spec is 65, the upper spec is 95. If sigma is 10, you can calculate quickly for yourself what your PCR is. So let's plug into that equation. 65 minus, sorry, um, Upper spec limit is 95, minus lower spec limit is 65, that's 30, divided by 6 sigma, divided by 6 times 10. So 30 divided by 60, your PCR is a little high. And if your PCR is 0.5, you're producing a substantial amount of your product outside of those limits. Let's take a look at a 6 sigma process. There's a 6 sigma process in this trip. Same lower, same upper lower. So LSL and USL are at the same place, but this time sigma, instead of 10 units, is one quarter of that. Sigma is two and a half. Your closest capability ratio is not two units. But notice what that is, right? You, you're in the middle over there, and you almost never get quite close to those spec limits. You're behaving very, very far away from those limits. Fact have a range of 12 sigma to move. The range from the low spec to the upper spec limit is 12 sigma for 12 standard deviations. And what that means is, you'll give us terminology in six sigma all the time, that you're producing only 3.4 defects for every million products you produce. So you send a million products out your door, only 3.4 of them will be. That's a very, very stringent requirement to have a six sigma process. Now, what I've shown you here has three key assumptions. Let's be clear on those. Firstly, we're assuming our process is well distributed. Secondly, we're assuming we're perfectly midway between the lower spec and the upper spec. And thirdly, we're assuming we calculated that when our process is. So when our process is stable, that's when you calculate your PCR. You cannot calculate your PCR when your process is unstable. That, that absolutely makes sense, right? You wouldn't, if your process is operating with data that's all over here because you're unstable, that's not a good period of time to be calculating your PCR. So don't use unstable data to calculate your process. You wait till your process is stabilized, then calculate the PCR. That second requirement, however, is unrealistic. We almost never are perfectly centered between our bounds. So what we do is we make a small modification to the formula for that. And that's now called PCR substrate K, or what we more commonly see is C. K is simply says consider one of two cases. If you're closer to your lower bound, then you use this formula over here on the right. Closer to your lower bound, use your target minus the lower limit by a percent. If you're closer to your upper bound, use your upper spec limit minus the target by a Because if you're closer to your upper bound, this 
down up in here is going to be very large. Because that is a large distance over there. How is it you close to your lower bound? This first term is going to be very large. So the minimum is always, you always pick the worst one. Like you never report optimistically. You always report pessimistically the worst possible situation. And then what you'll we'll have in the industry is you'll we'll have several standards. A bare minimum CPK is 1.3. If you're producing product that's used in safety applications, another 1.7 is used. And in systems that they want extremely stringent quality, then the class for CPK of 2 or more, which is what's called the 6 sigma process. It's a 6 sigma process because you can move 6 sigma to the left or 6 sigma to the right. So I'm going to jump over those two. Let's take this one here. Give this one a practice uh, low. So you've got CDK for a key variable of 1.3, you've got a target, you're closer to the lower limit, and you're giving your output. And what we're asking is, Right now, your CPK is 1.3. That's not acceptable. You want a CPK of 1.67. How can you improve to get 1.67? So work through that, think through that. Take a look also at the previous slide for the definition here of CPK. So take a look at that slide, this definition, and I'll leave the question up for you to work. Work through with someone else on this. This is very new material to you.
from the perspective of number line. So our lowest spec limit here is at 56. And our upper spec limit is at 93. Our target is given to us at 64. So 64 is closer to the lowest spec. So, there's, 
this is an example of CPK. Okay, what I will do is, I, there's one other example here in the slides. I will post the solution to that on the course website for you to try as well. So there's, uh, and I'll, I'll, in fact, I'll post two or three examples for you to, to try with solutions so you get a chance to have some practice with this.